I give a little brief uh, overview of agriculture uh, for this year. And overall, uh, farmers are, are pleased. You know, farmers are never really happy. But uh, we really had um, a good year with wheat, corn, soybean yields in the county. Uh, I'd say we're good, probably not what uh, farmers wanted and not what they were last year, but st still good. The north end of the county was a little drier, um, so we saw a reduction of uh, yields there. Cover crop um, in our county, we still, we fight between us and Kent County every year about who's going to be uh, top in acres for cover crop. So whatever you see growing out there in the field that's green now, that's cover crop. It's very important for what farmers do uh, to protect the soil and, and to protect uh, the bay. I guess, how many people have heard about avian influenza? <laughs> Everybody heard that in the news? Uh, so uh, avian influenza, if you didn't know, it's a virus. Uh, the waterfowl actually carry the virus. It doesn't affect them, doesn't make them sick, and we've learned now that also buzzards are carrying the avian influenza virus. In, their, one, in one teaspoon of their feces will kill a million chickens. So backyard chickens, our commercial broiler chickens, turkeys. So you can see that it's really um, very high, uh, very contagious. Uh, unfortunately, uh, avian influenza hit uh, our Delmarva region uh, in March of this year. I want to say last year, but it was still this year, right, Steve? Uh, and really what our Department of Agriculture uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture and really Delaware Department of Agriculture really worked well together. The integrators uh, came together and uh, we had to get the places cleaned up. We had to depopulate uh, the chickens, unfortunately, but that's what happens when avian influenza uh, hit, hits. I can't talk enough about how important biosecurity is. Whether you're a realtor, insurance agent, uh, farm credit, you know, and we're, we're going to farms just being uh, very careful of, you know, the clothes that you wear to a farm. Make sure you go home just like we did in COVID. You go home, you change, take your shoes off, you change your clothes, you get a shower. Just, just really important. So on our farms, as you know, I am also a chicken farmer with uh, my two sons um, and other chicken growers. So now instead of having just our chicken clothes, I call them with our boots, we have dedicated boots for every chicken house. So, but when we walk into a house, there's kind of a dirty line and there's a clean line. There's a bench that we can sit on from one side, we take off those boots and we put on that dedicated uh, footwear. They've really shown in all the um, investigations, I'll say that was done with the departments of agriculture, it's really that somebody has stepped into this feces and brought that um, into the house. Now it can also, the virus can also spread in the air. It could come in with rodents. I mean, a lot of different things. So if you do, if you're traveling from farm to farm and if you need any, have any questions, please reach out um, and, and let me know. So avian influenza has affected 46 states, 626 flocks, 360 of them have been uh, backyard flocks and 266 have been uh, commercial flocks. And unfortunately, uh, we've had to depopulate 50 million birds um, in the United States. That's a lot. So that's why you see an increase of uh, the price of eggs at the store. Um, anybody bought their turkeys yet? Probably they're a little more than um, they were uh, last year. And we did, a little, the last outbreak we had in Maryland was in October, and that was in Pasadena. That was in a backyard flock, and they were ducks. So please, if you talk to anybody, you know, if they have sick chickens, they have a backyard flock, it's very important that, you know, they call them, they can call me, they can call the Maryland Department of Agriculture, and we need to get right on it because once that um, disease hits, it really, um, most of your flock will probably be gone within a few days. Like I said, it's highly pathogenic. Uh, so on to brighter things. So as uh, we come out of COVID and we're back to being in person. We had a record attendance at our, our agronomy day this year. Uh, County Fair, my favorite week of the, of the year, uh, was back into uh, to full swing this year. We've been back uh, with farm tours. We had uh, economic development tour lead that works with me, sets on the economic development um, commission for Queen Anne's County. We took them around 
Uh, just two weeks ago, we had the Washington College students out uh, on a farm. We were talking about, couldn't take them in the chicken houses, but we could talk about chickens, had some videos, uh, talked about the grain industry. We also hosted the International Agriculture Leadership um, Conference here in uh, Maryland and Delaware. We had people from all over the world come, and we got to showcase uh, what we do here. And it's, uh, it makes you feel good when we can show all the good things that farmers have done because really our conservation here is just, it's stellar. Farmers from around the world and you know, even in the Midwest, the things that we do here are just uh, far above what other ones do. Uh, oh, and last but not least, Ag Awareness Day. We were back to have our Ag Awareness uh, Day. Jack will talk a little bit more about that, but our 600 plus uh, students, all the seventh graders get to come to our 4-H park and with the help of the FFA and 60 plus uh, volunteers um, in the state. Uh, Jessica's here. Where's Jessica Clark? Jessica here. She's one of the, there's Jessica back there that helps uh, with Ag Awareness. So it, it, takes, it takes a really big team to do that. But overall, it's, it's been a good year. It's, it's, back. it's good to be back in person. It's not that farmers or a lot of you didn't stop working. Probably this group here was still working. There was a lot of people that you know, were home and um, really buckled down. But we, in agriculture, we have to keep, uh, keep moving forward. So I will stop there and introduce our keynote speaker. So uh, my job for the chamber is to bring some agriculture information to the community. You know, what's, what's going in that agriculture? So as Lee and I were trying to brainstorm and Rachel in the office, think about what we could do, I'm like, huh, okay, I'm gonna invite Jack Wilson to come and talk about how Queen Anne's County supports agriculture. I mean, agriculture is the number one uh, industry uh, here in, um, in Maryland. So I think it's very important. So Jack, thank you for coming today. Good morning, everybody. Um, did anybody other than me find it odd when Jenny did her introduction that she said, if you don't know me? Because I think everybody knows Jenny. So, um, And thus the reason I'm here, because you don't say no to Jenny. And she came and she asked me, she said, Jack, would you, uh, would you be willing to uh, present at the Harvest Breakfast and give some highlights on some of the stuff that the commissioners and in your time being in there have been able to actually uh, do here for ag in Queen Anne's County and it's not a it's not a huge list and we uh, honestly as most of you know as farmers um, at the local level we really don't have a lot of uh, influence on policy that affects farmers regulations things like that it comes more from the state and federal level but we certainly when the opportunity arises or as the need arises we will advocate for the farmers at the state level we're very involved in the Maryland Association of Counties which is the largest lobbying group in the state and has a lot of influence when it comes to it. Um, we've been fortunate the last few years that we haven't had a lot of bills attacking agriculture. Uh, with the change in the administration, I'm not sure that that's going to be the same case for the next four years, but uh, we can keep our fingers crossed and hope. So to the end of talking about a few things that the commissioners have been able to do and we will continue to work on for the next four years, um, as the same group is pretty much back in place, uh, first thing is broadband. So. By a show of hands of our farmers in Queen Anne's County, not that I don't like Talbot or Caroline, but I'm more interested in Queen Anne's, obviously. How many people here that have farms have fiber or reliable broadband, or what I would call reliable broadband? Take a picture of those. Yeah, take a picture of those hands if you could. All, I, I can count them. That's for, yeah, I got those. Now, how many of you in, that are in the Queen Anne's County know whether you have broadband coming to your farm or house? Okay, wow. How many of you have no idea if you're ever gonna get broadband? <laughs> That's what I thought. So, so where we're at, North County has been very fortunate. We have three different providers in North County right now that are uh, deploying broadband. We have Talkie, we have Chop Tank Electric, and we have Breeze Line, formerly ABB. Um, the, in the order of their deployment and concentration, Talkie is pretty much leading the pack, Chop Tank is second, and Breeze Line is basically uh, still extending out from the town areas because that's where their uh, basis was. Um, if you want to know if you're going to get it or you want to have the ability to uh, sign up for it, I have my lovely wife here is going to have a sheet. I just need you to put your name and address and give me an email and I will have you back the answer as to what kind of timeline you're looking at for broadband where you live. Um, because we do have a comprehensive map, we have timelines, 
Um, and in North County right now, we're on a two-year cycle that all of North County will be served by fiber. It will be in front of your house on your local way. The, la the last mile is, is going to be the, uh, up to the individual, whether you want it or not. But it's going to be there within the next two years for you to hook up to if you'd like to. Um, that's a guarantee we have from Talkie. It's something they have to do because of federal grant money they receive to extend fiber broadband into unserved areas. So the broadband is looking good. When I first came into office, it was horrible. North County had nothing. Most of us were still using cell phones to uh, do what we could via the Internet. Um, one of the other things that we've embarked on, and it's actually fairly new, I think we've been doing it two years now, and Heather's going to yell at me if I get any of these facts wrong. Just, Heather Tonelli, could you stand up? Heather is our uh, Economic Development Director. She's been fantastic at working with, I know, Jenny and the Chamber and stuff, uh, ag-related, um, tours, things like that. We're really trying to do a lot of new things and, and get some synergy in between all those departments. But we uh, created a program, and you hear the word Upper Shore Regional Council today from me in, in a, a couple different aspects. Um, the Upper Shore Regional Council is a council that is comprised of Kent, Queen Anne's, and uh, Cecil County. Um, we have money that comes through the state under a normal grant program that uh, funds the operations and goes down to each county, typically in thirds, uh, in what we do with it. In Queen Anne's, we've chosen basically a couple different things. Uh, one of them, and Jenny already spoke to it, Ag Awareness Day. One of the first things I did when I got on the uh, Upper Shore Regional Council was look at Ag Awareness Day, and there was a funding shortage. So we've made it now a permanent funding item in the Upper Shore Regional Council to give $10,000 every year to Ag Awareness Day. So in, in perpetuity, it will continue to be funded. <clears throat> to that end, I'm also looking to expand Ag Awareness Day um, to find other things we can do with it, other things we can get into the schools with uh, in the future. And we have set aside funding, too, to help uh, that move along as, as we find items. And those that uh, know are tasked with it already know that they're supposed to be looking for stuff. So um, the other item at Upper Shore Regional Council, which is uh, started on, it's been two years old, is called an Ag Micro Grant. And what that is is it's a pot of money that's been basically the Upper Shore Regional Council put in money, uh, Queen Anne's County Commissioners, uh, Kent County Commissioners and Cecil County Council uh, matched the money. So it created a pot of money that I think, uh, hold on, and I never bring notes up, but I had to because there's a lot of numbers involved in some of this stuff. Um, $305,534 to date has been put into the micro uh, ag grant program. And what that program does, it's not huge amounts of money, but it's money that helps uh, some of our uh, ag programs either start, so it's seed money for some of the stuff, other ways of re uh, creating revenue on your farm, if you have ideas for marketing and along those lines. So to date, in 22, I don't have the 29 numbers, and I probably did have them, but I didn't copy them down. The 22, in Queen Anne's County, we did 12 projects for $48,000, and they ranged all over the place from marketing, for equipment, things like that. So about an average grant of $4,000. And again, I know it's not a lot, but it, it's something if you're a small farm and you're looking for, uh, to do some experimentation on something new, it's a good way to do it. Um, we also, through the Upper Shore Regional Council, we've dedicated almost $300,000 into more BIDCO grants. And sadly, I don't think that gets out enough, but it's really designed for new and young farmers to take advantage of through more BIDCO. Um, that pot of money is up there now. I'm going to say it's almost in a half million dollar range. And I think we've had two people in Queen Anne's County since we instituted it. So anybody you know or is looking to do something, contact the Upper Shore Regional Council, Susan O'Neill. There is money there available um, via grant. So um, let's see. We covered that. We covered that. Okay. So the next thing the commissioners, and as long as I've been commissioner, and honestly the time before, but we've really concentrated since I've been commissioner and my fellow commissioners are here now, and if she could, Donna, could you stand up for a second, is the farm preservation. We've, we take it probably more seriously than anybody, any commissioners prior to us. Um, and, and just as an example, in, since 2014 when this uh, group of commissioners were seated, we have... Uh, preserved 9,512 acres of farmland um, to the tune of $36,919,345 to our farmers, both from state and county funding. And Donna, please stand up again. You don't, 
People don't know how hard she works to get that, but I'll tell you right now. So, my question, my second survey question is, how many people in the room that have farms are in preservation? Fantastic. All right, that's more than the broadband for sure. All right, how many in the room are on the list to try and get in preservation? All right. Well, good. We're doing a pretty good job then. That was much lower than the ones that have it already. So, um, again, if you want, if you have a farm and you're interested in preservation, Donna, and she's going to be with us for at least another 20 years, she will be glad to take your information and have you be a part of that. Um, but yeah, we're really proud of that. And one of the things we did um, for those, and I, I don't want to go down the, the solar rabbit hole, so I'm going to make this brief of what we're doing with solar. When the uh, bill was signed four years ago, that the state would have to be a 50% renewable energy by 2025. Uh, we, we saw the light and realized the Eastern Shore was going to come under attack for large scale utility solar um, because we're flat, we get a lot of sun, it makes sense. Um, but what we looked at was the tax structure on these large companies, and by the way, that I know of, all the ones in Queen Anne's County are from out of state, save for one, but they were supposed to be out of state, but now we find out they're not. But anyway, um, they're all out-of-state companies. They're coming in. They're taking up, you know, large tracts of land, 400 to 600 acres on an average utility-grade solar. Um, and basically, they were paying the ag tax for that land, and that's it. You're bringing in a $90 million investment, and the county got nothing out of it. And the farm specifically got zero out of it other than the lease payment. Not against solar, uh, utility solar. It's, it's going to happen. But we've got to control it, we've got to look at it, we had to figure out a way to make that work for us. So what we did is we found a loophole in the state Comar that allowed us to put a personal property tax on any large scale renewable energy, which this fell into that category. So now what we do is we get a tax on these large utility grade solars. We then take that tax and we have dedicated that to farm preservation. So any money that comes in under that tax structure goes directly into account, which then goes into Donna's wallet, and then she's able to go get us some more preserved farmland. And it will continue in perpetuity because we passed a law, county ordinance, that that money must be used for that. So for as long as they keep trying to bring solar here, and as much as some people don't like it, and I personally don't like some of the places they're looking at, at least the county will benefit and the farms will benefit on the back end. And it's the best we can do because this is a state mandate. It's coming down from the feds. We fought it. We've lost the courts. There's already precedence to lose when the counties go to fight it. So we're just trying to make the best of what could be a bad situation on that. The other thing as commissioners that we do is we, uh, we look at uh, sponsorships for different things. We uh, fully fund uh, the request for the ag extension. We fully fund everything that soil conservation brings in. And to our FFA youth here, every time they've come to us and asked us for money so they could go to the national convention, we have done it. Even though this group has not fulfilled their obligation, which is to come before the commissioners after going and give us an update on what they did out there. <laughs> but I have promised earlier that they will be in front of us within the next two months. So, uh, But we will continue to support that because we, we look at it, it's important. Ag, we, we cannot overstate enough that we all have to eat and how important ag is to it and to the economy in general. It's got to start somewhere. And the ag community works night and day, like Jenny said, and Linda said, and you guys are the producers. And without you, nothing runs, nothing. So we've got to make sure we have a future in that. And these young folks sitting right here are our future, and we feel like it's important to support them and to continue to support them and the ones that come behind them. Um, let's see. Oh, since we're in the college, good segue. So the other thing is, um, and me personally, and I'm not going to go into all that, but the CTE programs, um, all of you, and for those that aren't familiar, it's Career Technology Education is what it stands for. Um, it is lacked in the county, it's lacked in the country um, for the last 30 years. We've made a commitment here in Queen Anne's, along with the college, our EDC, our Chamber of Commerce, to bring that back to, at a minimum, Queen Anne's County. And to that end, on the ag side, ones that would particularly um, be uh, of interest to you would be the fact that we do have an ag program here at the college. Though it is kind of in its youngling stages, it will grow. Uh, we had over 100 and, hold on, I got the number here, 170 people just about a month ago do a tour here. And we looked at a bunch of the different CTE stuff at the college. Uh, 
when we got to the one where it came to the ag, you had a choice to go see what teachers do or go see what the ag uh, does. And I will say, at least in my group, it was a 90-10 split. Everybody wanted to go see ag, only 10% wanted to go be teachers. So um, that's good news. It means we got a lot of interest in it. <clears throat> we also have a welding program, which has been completely revamped um, and redone. And I believe, Dave, it's pretty much sold out, right? It's a... Yeah, we, we can't offer enough courses. Right. So, and then, of course, we have a CDL class here that is also, I was, when we took the tour of that, I think they're booked up till next June is the earliest you can get into CDL. So it's great to see that we're backfilling some of those industries that have been lacking uh, post-COVID. Um, and, uh, and last but not least, um, and probably one of the things that, and again, this, the Upper Shore Regional Council has been very beneficial. Everything we've worked with them, we've really focused on the ag community. So we had an opportunity this past year, Governor Hogan, um, on his way out the door as part of his budget, he earmarked uh, $50 million for the um, five uh, regional councils, which obviously were one of them. So we were the recipients of $10 million in our Upper Shore Regional Council. Uh, amongst us, we decided that we were going to take two point something million anyway and put into each county, and each county would decide how they wanted to push that money out uh, locally. So amongst our commissioners, we decided immediately that our single biggest project in our mind that had to be done was to renovate and fix the 4-H park. So to that end, when we got done, we took and worked with the 4-H park board and the fair board, and they gave us a list of the wants and needs, and it came to roughly $1.2 million to fix every project they had in their five-year long-term capital. And I'm happy to say today that every single one of those is funded. They got the full $1.2 million. They have two years, so that park will look shiny and new in two years because all those projects will be completed. It's, it's a big task, but <laughs> I am confident they will get it done because there was a lot of uh, uh, excitement when it came in. So um, beyond that, again, like I said, our commissioners are always going to be dedicated to ag. We realize how important it is. Um, only, and personally, I'm not a, a farmer either. Um, my family, though, is from the Lower Shore, uh, going back a generation. But uh, I'm an electrician by trade. I'm blue collar. I work with my hands. So I get what it is to put in a hard day's work and, and, and what the results are on the back end. And I know you guys, you do one of the most rewarding jobs ever because you see your hard work, you watch it grow, and then you get to tear it down and come to a great breakfast like this. So, um, But that's it for the commissioners. And, and if anybody has any questions of the commissioners, don't hesitate to call. We all wear our phones 24-7. We all have emails, and we're certainly happy to help you with anything you need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack, and thank you uh, to you and all the commissioners for all the things that you do for us in, in agriculture. And, and the, job, the job that Donna does is phenomenal, working you know, with all the farmers to bring ag land preservation uh, money to here. So, Donna, I commend you on that. And, all the educational things and so now that you're all here and you hear Jack wants to give us more money for ag education, Mr. Page <laughs> from the Board of Education, uh, we'll, we'll get to work and figure out what are the next things that, that we want. I would really like to get into the uh, probably more of the elementary schools and maybe start earlier, but that's going to take, that's going to be quite a big task, but we will we'll work. We go into the schools now, but not, you know, blanket. If we get Invite it, we'll go into the schools and teach, but we'll, we'll work on that. So thank you very much.